Uh, welcome to session 2C titled uh, Adapting to Rapid Growth at a De Decentralized MDR Plant. Uh, if you need CEUs, Alexander in the back will be stamping your sheets for you. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have Ann Dickey and Tyler Schlecht. Um, Tyson, is that the last name right? <laughs> um, sorry about that, Tyson Schlecht. Um, Ann Dickey is a water and sewer manager for the Dry Creek Ranch Master Plan community and has a long tenure in environmental compliance and water resources management. Tyson Schlecht is a wastewater process engineer and project manager for HDR, working on a lot of projects related to bio, um, biological nutrient removal. He is also a father of three daughters and an adjunct, adjunct professor of natural philosophy at New St. Andrews College. Please welcome Tyson and Anne. Thanks, Karen. Just came out of a great presentation from uh, Laurel Strom, who I went to school with at Washington State. So I have to say, go Cougs. And I also went to UW, so go Huskies. <laughs> I'm not a Broncos fan, though. So let's see. <clears throat> How do we actually switch slides? Is this the, where's the toggle? How do we switch slides? Hmm. Oh. This could be interesting. Okay, so uh, the the main point I want to start with, and we'll see if we can can get this to work. Um, this is for the Dry Creek Sewer Plant. It's a, it's a very small decentralized facility. And the case I want to make is that is that uh, decentralized wastewater management is here to stay as uh, an element of the overall water picture in our industry. And it's really a key part of, I think, water reuse and, and the vision from the keynote this morning. And so there's a unique set of challenges associated with that and a unique set of solutions that really are a different paradigm from the traditional municipal POTW context. And um, so this presentation really is gonna focus on, on some of that different paradigm and the challenges and solutions associated with that. So uh, we're gonna go through a bit of an introduction so you can get your bearings and a, a bit of a facility overview so you can get a feel for the unique aspects of this facility. And then we'll just step through uh, some of the challenges and solutions, which are are kind of more diverse and and um, slightly more nuanced, I guess, than than some of the stricter uh, scientific um, analyses of a larger publicly owned treatment works. So, by way of introduction, um, to help make my case, I will invite none other than George Shabanaglas. And, and if he says something, we should all listen. And um, back in 2004, he pointed this out, that, that decentralized wastewater management, which we use the acronym DWM, um, which he defines as the collection, treatment, and reuse of wastewater from individual homes, clusters of homes, subdivisions, and isolated commercial facilities at or near the point of waste generation, that this as a paradigm um, is gonna stick around. And he, and he made an inter interesting point in this publication back in 2004 that, um, and he said, this is a quote, in the early 1970s with the passage of the Clean Water Act, it was often stated that it was only a matter of time before sewerage facilities would be able to, uh, available to almost all residents of the continental United States. But now more than 25 years later, it is recognized the complete sewerage of the entire US may never be possible due to both geographic and economic constraints. Because complete sewerage is unlikely in the foreseeable future, it is clear that DWM systems are needed for the protection of public health and the environment and for the development of long-term strategies for the management of our water resources. And since that time, 
uh, there has been a growing number of, of decentralized wastewater management facilities. And so that's, um, that's really where we're going here is, is what are the steps to success within that paradigm? So there are some challenges inherent in, in this approach, um, things like phased construction to balance with financial capital for, for localized developments, a high operability index, which I'll mention in a minute, um, average flow and load versus installed capacity. If you have this phased approach, oftentimes you have way more installed capacity than the actual flow and load you're seeing, and then staffing and maintenance. So here, in terms of phasing and installed capacity at Dry Creek, there are a couple of challenges. Um, this is a graph of basically the, the draft phasing profile of the facility as a whole. And um, the blue line represents homes that are plotted for, for construction. The red line represents homes occupied. And you'll notice there's about, um, I'm not showing the, the, the timeline just for, for the sake of uh, the planning of the, of the facility, but in general, there's about a two year delay between plotting and occupancy. But more importantly, in order to plot the next bit of land, you need to have installed capacity at the treatment facility. And so really with something like the phase three construction, it's giving you enough capacity that's gonna last you all the way through phase four, but you need to have that substantially complete before you can even plot the land. And so the implication is you have installed capacity for you know, 1400 homes, but in the near term, your occupancy is only 400. And so that triangle represents excess capacity that you're operating with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there's a number of challenges associated that, with that, like running pumps low on the VFD or cyclic operations of equipment. And so design of modularity is really critical in, in this context. The other thing, the op, what, I, what I call the operability index, it's this idea that for any magnitude of operational change, there's a really outsized impact on the magnitude of process performance change. And this makes these plants really hard to operate. If, if your performance is, the more sensitive your performance is to your operational decisions, the more stress you have on a day-to-day -day basis. And so just by way of comparison, uh, we don't have to follow these numbers, but you have a, a municipal POTW say with 18 MGD on the left, and you have a decentralized wastewater treatment system with 0 0.05 MGD on the right. And so almost based on, on percentage of size or order of magnitude size, say you have the same operational tweak, which is you change your wastage rate by 1200 gallons per day, you run a pump at a different speed. If you look at the implications for solids inventory, there's virtually no change for the large facility, but for a system as small as, as this kind of decentralized system, that change results in a significant difference in SRT, uh, 25 to 20 days. And so that, that little operational change has this outsized impact. Um, and that's just really critical to understand as well in terms of optimization and constructability and phasing. Now these challenges, particularly with Dry Creek are amplified in 2019, 2020, um, 2021 by, by migration um, in part due to the, the you know, massive relocation of people uh, during the pandemic. And so this picture is from uh, Business Insider and the blue, the darker the blue, the more net migration into the area there is. And Ada County, um, oops. Ada County is, uh, And it's light blue, but actually the the um, it's on the high it's almost dark blue, and it's on the high end of actually net domestic migration of 13, over thirteen thousand people, and this really stimulated an, an acute need for expansion of the Dry Creek facility since they're in the business of giving people homes to live in, and that led to a change in wastewater flow at the facility from nine thousand gallons a day in the spring of twenty twenty of 2019 to 50,000 gallons per day in 2022. Now, just to put this in context, that's 5% growth month over month. And if you compare that to say a typical uh, municipal planning at a POTW type of paradigm, we're looking at say two to 4% on a really steep growth curve annual year over year for a POTW. Uh, and here it's 5% growth month over month. It's about 80% annual growth. 
And so if you just look at the, the comparison, a, a typical planning line might be the blue and it's basically a flat line in comparison. And so that's really the challenge that, that started off this, uh, this bit of improvement at the plan. And so Anne's gonna give it a little bit of a facility overview. The Drake Creek Ranch is um, a master plan community in Eagle, I'm north of Eagle, Idaho, a few miles. Um, historically, for over 100 years, it was used as grazing and cropland by the Jeter family. Um, it was purchased by um, a developer and approved for over 3,500 homes in 2010, but remained undeveloped. Um, the Boys and Hunter Homes bought it in 2015 and wanted to honor the, his, the historical agriculture, agricultural use of the area and um, wanted to, so they reduced the number of homes to uh, by half, about half, about 1,815 homes, made larger, more open space um, and more larger lots and tried to give it a more rural feel. Um, so it was modified, uh, approved for, the modification was approved in, in 2017. And um, this community does um, have about 375 homes um, can, uh, occupied right now, another 50 homes under construction. Um, it does have a nice rural feel to it. And um, people there are really enjoying it. A lot, uh, lot more children than I expected when I started here. Um, it was designed as a sustainable community. The farm to market or farm to table was just part of the um, sustainable design, um, mostly to reduce the number of average trips and reduce them by thereby reduce the amount of fuel the community used as a whole. Um, so there's a seven acre school site, 85,000 square feet of commercial plan for those uh, frequent daily things that you need, uh, some basic groceries and gasoline. Um, there's athletic fields and community centers within the community, giving them ready access to recreation, along with uh, integrated trails uh, that go all the way from Eagle um, way north. There's a miles and miles and miles of integrated trails, both hiking, bike, or all three, biking, hiking, and equestrian trails. Um, one of our neighboring communities has uh, trailer parking facilities, so you can trailer, trailer your horse in and um, uh, ride these trails. Uh, Dry Creek Ranch has equestrian facilities under construction so that you can board your horse there and ride it to the trails and not have to go get your trailer, go get your horse and, and bring it back home to ride it on the trails. Um, the farm we have, and you can see a picture right here, this is our senior farm. It's managed by Farmer Dan there at the bottom. Um, we have 90, it has a CSA program with 90 members this year. Um, he has Tuesday and, um, and Saturday farmers markets, some you pick options, and uh, he's brought in some locally sourced meat and eggs as well. So this saves the grocery trip um, in addition to honoring that agricultural history. There's a wildlife conservation fund that's collected every time a house closes and annually from the homeowners. Uh, the intent is to uh, fund conservation programs to offset the impacts to wildlife uh, that this community has caused. Um, there's a water conservation plan as well. Um, this community was approved when, at the time when Ada County was promoting and encouraging development of facilities that were outside cities areas of impact as long as it didn't de degrade the public utilities. So in a sense, please develop this land, bring your own bring your own utilities, bring your own sewer plant, bring your own water. Um, so our, the water conservation plan, we took uh, those agricultural irrigation rights, this 100 year old agricultural irrigation rights and converted them to municipal, uh, some of them. And uh, that is our public water supply source. Um, that water is used within the community and then sanitary waste is treated on site at the MBR facility. Treated effluent is discharged into rapid infiltration basins, creating a closed or community contained water cycle. Um, our goal, the goal, you know, primary goal for this Dry Creek Sewer Company is not that different from any any other sewer wastewater recycling facility. It's to provide state-of-the-art 
um, decentralized waste management for the Dry Creek Ranch Master Plan community. There are some uh, uh, unique aspects to some of these goals. We wanted water conservation, capacity for development, cost control, and compliant operation. Uh, but because the uh, uh, because of the unique nature and, and not um, municipal or not public utility features, it is a private, privately owned sewer system. They're not, um, they don't qualify for EPA and DEQ grants. So all of this, the facility had to be constructed at cost to the developer prior to the first home being constructed. Um, so cost control was integral. integral. Capacity for development, um, I was surprised. Uh, uh, thrilled this morning when I heard Phyllis say, maybe we shouldn't be building a huge facility up front. Maybe we should be building more of a temporary facility. And then when we find out what the challenges and changes are, then we modify that facility. And that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, the design has enabled us to do with the modular um, option. Um, and this innovative, all of the innovative site specific design was what we needed to meet all of these goals, um, the MBR, UV system, RAS bioreactor, nitrogen removal, and the um, upgraded capacity to, or, or capability to upgrade the capacity um, and in addition to the RI basin disposal. Tyson will go through a process for us. So just to get your bearings on, on what we're dealing with from a treatment perspective, um, the influent comes in, I'll show in a minute some uh, characteristics of a purely residential sewerage system, which I think should be understood in new developments, even in a POPW uh, sewer sheds. It goes into a lift station down in the, in the valley and then up to the plant through two millimeter screening to protect the membranes into equalization, which is really critical for MBR operations since it's hydraulically uh, limited on the flux. Um, through a RAS standpipe, which I'll mention in a second. But then the heart of the system really is the uh, MLE process in an MBR configuration to remove total nitrogen. Uh, and I'll linger there in a minute. And then uh, the permeate from the membranes goes out through UV disinfection to an effluent break tank, which is a place where it hydraulically breaks and then is pumped up to rapid infiltration basins. No solid stream here, liquid disposal is wax. And here's a site layout of that, of that same process. So um, the big tanks outside are the EQ tank in the middle right. Uh, the bioreactor tank that's operational is on, on page south there. The heart of the treatment system, the, the, the membranes and the UV disinfection are inside the bigger building. And then uh, influent screening and effluent pumping actually are, are in two um, bifurcated sides of that top building. Drone pictures are cool. That's like super high res. <laughs> when I got that, I blew my mind. Okay, so so there's some specific challenges here I want to highlight for Dry Creek that we've really had to work through that are again on a different paradigm from a municipal treatment works. You have to understand capacity limitations and the difficulty of expanding in a way that makes sense, uh, given the increments of the unit processes, and then. Um, how to optimize for TN removal in, in, a, in a decentralized plant that, again, is very difficult to operate. And then Anne will finish with some staffing and expertise and, and O&M considerations. So from a capacity limitation standpoint, um, it's diff it, we had to, that, that acute capacity need was triggered by that migration pattern. So you have, you have record home sales hitting and we, we want to plot the next homes. So what do we have to expand in the modular plant ASAP in order to accommodate that need? Well, we had to break down the plant into its very basic components um, and the unit processes because each of these has a unit of equipment really that's modular. And the, the trick with assigning a capacity to this plant is everything has a different capacity rating. And so you have to break out everything and that's what we did in this, in this graph is, is express things in terms of number of homes. And you have to do a lot of legwork to, to do this um, and account for redundancy in each of the unit processes. But now in a graph like this, you can see the, 
the leapfrogging that occurs when you add capacity. So what we found in the near term is you have bioreactor capacity and UV disinfection were the critical items to increase the overall capacity of the, of the system. And so we kind of mapped that out to the build out of the facility in different phases. And the green phase was really the hot item off the press. And that was the bioreactor volume and UV disinfection. And, and then you come in with phase three in red and sort of leapfrog in ways that allow the development to allocate its cash flow most effectively. And what, what's interesting to me is just that they're all misaligned. And I guess that's the challenge of a, of a decentralized facility like this and kind of need this visibility in order to decide where to spend the next dollar. This um, triggered a, a, a rapid chain of events from both the housing planning side, the engineering effort and the facility construction partnered with the contractor. Now this is really critical for the success that Dry Creek saw in expanding the facility on a compressed timeline. Um, Cause you have the acute housing demand kicking it off. And then we do that unit process evaluation that I showed and that feeds out to the master plan build out scenario. But what we need is early out items for the bioreactor and UV, which are long lead equipment. So there was a collaboration between the owner, the engineer and the contractor almost on, it was almost a pseudo design build type of relationship um, and worked really well collaboratively on, on the private side to make this happen. And so the, the bioreactor got procured, the detailed design um, came off of that early out item and, and then uh, kept going on through. And, and I'll just highlight that you'll notice in that particular stage of, of the process, all three groups are present in that box, which was kind of peak pandemic, uh, peak housing demand, peak everything, peak flow, peak everything. And uh, the collaboration really, really went a long way on um, getting those lead light, long lead items out. So here's just a few pictures to give you an idea. There's a, one of the influence screens. That's a modular construction, two millimeter rotary screen. Um, here's the RAS standpipe, which, which looks pretty rad, <laughs> um, but it's needed because the whole facility is above grade, which again is a unique aspect of a cost-effective build when you don't have any users and therefore no cash. Um, but it's difficult later on when you're trying to combine RAS and influent and then split them between the bioreactors. So this RAS standpipe serves as a inter integration point for all of those things to combine RAS and influent and then split it effectively between the modular units. Um, it also has some plug flow kinetics in there when the RAS and primary influent are first combined. Here's the bioreactor with fine bubble diffusers. I'll make a point on, on the roof here in a second. Here's the original NBR unit, fully redundant in itself. It's got two halves. So there's redundant equipment on the back side of that. And here's two new units uh, stuffed tightly into the building for more NBR capacity. So these are added additional to augment the, the MBR solid separation piece. And there are the UV units, two operational on the right, one um, currently not operational on the left, fully NWRI certified for reuse. So here's where I want to, uh, but we'll linger for just a little bit. Um, TN removal. There's a limit of 10. Now this is a this this is a tight limit, and so to remind you, the heart of the system is we remove nitrate in the pre-anoxic zone by recycling it back from the aerobic zone. It's produced nitrate that is uh, by the aerobic oxidation of incoming ammonia and hydrolysis of organic nitrogen. And the, um, the only way to remove it is to get it back. And so MBRs have a high RAS rate. There's no internal mixed liquor recycle. This system runs about a five Q recycle. And in that front zone, provided there's sufficient carbon, um, you get rid of the nitrate to nitrogen gas. Now there are a couple of challenges here um, that I wanna highlight high influent TKN cold temperature and diminishing returns on RAS rate. From the high influent TKN standpoint, this, this is what I meant when um, purely new residential construction has very different characteristics from legacy MOP8 uh, municipal sewerage design guidelines. 
in particular, an average TKN of 63. This is really tricky when your limit is 10, okay? <laughs> and, and I'll point that out in a second. Uh, typical strength in the Treasure Valley is about 40 to 50. So right off the bat, man, if you're looking at TN removal, you've got a big challenge on your hands. Um, I overlaid BOD here. So the average BOD in red is 320 against the TKN. And, um, and uh, just a side note is, this is the ratio of BOD to TKN is, and 5.2 is the average, is that good enough uh, for total nitrogen removal? Um, it depends. But fortunately in this case, the BOD is sufficient to get pretty complete nitri uh, denitrification in the pre anoxic zone, provided we can get the nitrates back. Um, and that's dependent on a whole, whole number of factors, but in our case, 5.2 seems to be sufficient. Terry McCarty has a, a paper here on that, but uh, I want to linger elsewhere. Here's a carbon uh, dosing system that we put in. It's a nice hedge against that issue of BOD to TKN, especially given the, the range of TKN concentrations. Um, so there's a little chemical metering pump. The nice thing about a decentralized facility is the peak demand for carbon is going to be like 0.5 gallons per hour at full build out. And so it's a, it's a small system and can be heavily impactful. That's where you can use the operational uh, that operational index to your advantage, a small change in carbon has a big change in TN performance, potentially. Uh, cold temperature, I'll, I'll just highlight really quickly. That was a challenge early on uh, with an open tank. This is a heat balance from Mike Stenstrom at UCLA. He published a model for this in 1995. And a typical municipal plant um, you see on the right. And what really dominates the heat balance is, is the heat input on the, on the right, which is solar radiation, and the heat output on the left, which is surface evaporation, those two big blue pieces. And um, if you get rid of those, then the reaction heat and the blower heat have a much bigger impact on keeping heat retained in the system. And so uh, a covered tank really makes a big difference on a small scale where your volumes, um, your volumes simply are, 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 well, they're a lot smaller. And so it's easier to lose heat, sensible heat uh, quickly in an above ground bolt to steel tank. And so uh, we put a cover on that. So here's a picture of the cover. Um, cold temperature means long SRT. That's, you know, that's what the math means. The washout SRT on AOBs is about nine and a half days. That's without any safety factor at all. And you saw that the peak to average TKN load was about two, so ranges from you know, 120 or 130 is the peak TKN. And so really you want an SRT of in the neighborhood of 15 to 18 days. So that's a lot of bioreactor for the amount of load that you have. So that's something to be aware of. It's, it's a little different there in my mind than, um, than some other design criteria. I'll talk about ethylene ammonia in a, in a little bit. Okay. You can only go so low on nitrogen. That's the kicker. So this is a graph of effluent nitrate versus grass rate. And, and there's a formula. It's, it's a simple mass balance. It's one of my favorite formulas. I like simple formulas. Uh, your remaining nitrate, which is NE, is equal to the amount of nitrate you produce, which is NOx, divided by one plus your recycle rates. And in this case, we don't have an IR, so it's just, it's just R that we care about. Um, and so what you see is a graph of the remaining effluent nitrate, depending on what the RAS rate is at the facility. And I have three lines there. And the three lines represent three different incoming TKN concentrations. So if you have perfect anoxic zone performance, this is, this is really the best you can do. So if you have a very high, i.e. 63 TKN, TKN concentration, and it's fluctuating, then you know, at a RAS rate of five or six, you're gonna be right there in that sweet spot of the permit limit of 10. And, um, and so there's a lot of operational nuance that I think has been learned to really try to dial that in and make sure we're getting good performance there. And one of those things is, um, is cyclic aeration. And th this is where I, I wanna show it just for a second. Uh, TN is in gray and effluent ammonia is in red. And you can see uh, 
this is from November of last year to the current data we have, there's kind of a, there, there's kind of a bouncing around of TN that you might expect given the, the recycle rate graph I just showed, um, where you're, you're hovering right in that kind of eight to 10 range and are really depending on some, some averages of the arithmetic mean for the month. But then we had this period of really good TN performance. I was like, what, <laughs> you know, what was going on? Well, it turns out the, uh, the operator, because the installed capacity is so much higher than the load coming in, he couldn't maintain a, a low enough DO in the aerobic zone, turning the blowers all the way down. So he turned the blowers off and kept turning them on and off to kind of get in that sweet spot of, of a deal of two. Well, during that time, TN dropped really low. And so cyclic aeration, I think, holds a key to, it's a, it's a lever you can pull on a decentralized system, put it on the timer, find that sweet spot. And, and it, there was enough residual carbon in the reserves in that bioreactor to, to, to really bring that nitrate down to, I mean, the nitrate was like two, three, that range, pretty routine. Um, so that was an interesting result. And if you overlay, I'm gonna make this slide in the middle, this I'm missing for now, but I overlaid uh, ammonia in red on a different scale so you could see what happened. And you'll, uh, you definitely see that during periods of cyclic aeration, there's, there's variability in ammonia, which is what you would expect. And it went from you know, virtually non-detect up to you know, one, 1 1.5 from time to time. And so there's some, there's that trade-off there between nitrification and TN removal. That's that teeter-totter. And I think that's where the, the op opportunity for optimization at the plant, looking at developing some, some sort of hardwired cyclic aeration timeframes uh, built into the SCADA system would be really helpful um, <clears throat> to find that low point of TN removal. Um, foaming in that context is another conversation. <laughs> and you, we can ask about that later if we want. All right, so every every uh, sewer facility, wastewater recycling facility needs a certified operator. Um, in our case, the um, wastewater treatment facility at Dry Creek Ranch requires a class three wastewater treatment, a class two wastewater collections and a land application certification for our operator. Anyone wanna take a guess at how many operators there are certified in Idaho with all three of these minimum, because they could be class four treatment, right? Okay, raise your hands. Any, any guesses? Go ahead. Oh, zero. <laughs> no, um, as, of, as of last week, there were more, there were 30, um, but that, that means you have your choice of 30 people who can operate your facility and most of them are already employed. <laughs> Um, so uh, what we did is, uh, the, what the company did at the time was sent out a letter to every certified operator in the state and said, so I was shaking your head, I'm, some people, this was a memorable letter. Um, it should have said, um, come work for us, we have lots of challenges, tight permit limits, and you get to work with pipe and NEM. <laughs> um, it'll be fun. We did find our um, an, an operator with these um, certifications that came to work for us, but it's not a one person job. It's not. Uh, 40 hours a week, most weeks, but it is it does require 24-7, 365 um, on call. Um, so what we did find was a number of certified operators who were willing to take a side gig or looking for a side gig or looking for a different side gig. Um, and so um, we have a operations team now, and one of them's a good mechanic, one of them's uh, great at um, collecting our groundwater and surface water samples. And so it's, it's worked out really well. Um, one of the other challenges, uh, or as far as staffing, this is my position, so I think it's really important. Um, but it's, uh, I feel like I'm a very on hand public works director. I uh, touch everything from the customers to the um, how much we bill every month, operations, and I do have a, a long history in environmental compliance, so I've taken on the regulatory reporting and, and that. Um, it's a juggling act of, of tying the three companies together and being the collaborator. Just an example is uh, whenever things come up, issues or um, uh, upgrades, 
uh, my operator will give me really great ideas and Tyson will give me really great ideas and they will never be the same. So it's on me to make a decision um, of what we wanna do first and, um, and then take that to the company as far as um, costs and recommendation of where to go from here. Uh, another thing we really wanted was asset management, structured O&M and asset management. <clears throat> um, as an example, um, uh, you know, because we're constantly upgrading and, and adding assets at different times, when did the warranty uh, go out? Who was the vendor? Where did we get it? Was it provided by Suez or the contractor or somebody else? Um, and um, this is an example. We had a valve actuator failure. Who is the vendor? What, is it under warranty? Is it still available? Should we upgrade? And uh, so our solution was a computerized maintenance management system. We picked fix and it's a work in progress to roll into that. Um, but here is in our list of equipment, our actuated ball valve is, is highlighted. And then um, this system allows us to unlimited storage, cloud storage that I can have the, um, the, the manufacturer specifications, the um, warranty and, and everything right there for the um, operators to pull up um, either on their iPads or I can access it from the office as well. So um, with that, are there any questions? We're um, live streaming, so if you can ask your questions in the mic. <laughs> So how do you keep the funding going? Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, there was the initial capital investment of, per, of installing the, the smallest um, possible facility. And then as homes um, were constructed, there was the trunk connection fees um, and um, the monthly fees as well for operational expenses, just like a municipal facility. Um, but it, yeah, it's basically being funded by the developer still. small the community is and obviously wastewater equipment is not keeps cheap. going up and up in price so i'm just trying to like i mean do you guys have any other uh like are you thinking outside the box for 10 years down the road for how you're going to fund this and, and when everything's sold and you still got to keep it going um well uh, the model shows at that point it will be funding itself um, at, 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 there's a certain breakover point and then it will be funding itself. Um, our monthly fees are high um, because uh, we don't have the support of the, you know, the um, DEQ or EPA funding. Um, our, our rates are higher compared to Eagle and other surrounding um, communities. Hi. Um, with what you've learned through what you've gone through and the rapid growth, what would you, um, what would you do differently on knowing if you knew you were going to experience that amount of growth um, and sort of what are some nuggets for other communities that think they may uh, experience a growth that's similar to that? I, I would say um, I, I think that if we knew the growth was coming sooner and the cash flow might be coming sooner, <laughs> um, there may have been some uh, things added in the original uh, uh, facility itself that would have uh, made things move a little smoother. Uh, would have built in those modular things up front. Yeah. Um, On the engineering side, um, I was talking with with Jim Hunter, the owner, uh, kind of right when that acute need took off. And and one of the things he was saying is is boy, I wish we would have um, basically got uh, a long term, a more detailed long term plan including specific equipment that needed to be bought in the build out and then near term designs done on the engineering side and basically ready to go when the plot need arrived and really the phase 2 design was reactive but the phase 3 design we really got ahead of the eight ball on that one and and got it ahead of the need for plotting so i think that that was determinative okay thank you uh, that's all the time we have for this session so thank you